that we've looked at what shapes the interiors of worlds, it's time to move on and study the surface geology. Here's where we look at all of the processes that shape the surfaces of solid worlds. Unlike interiors, we can usually observe planetary surfaces, so we have a lot more information on how different surface processes play out. In this chapter, we'll be talking about worlds with solid surfaces. So we won't be talking about the four big Jovian planets, their liquid worlds instead, but we will be looking at many of their moons. We'll start in this presentation by looking at the four important surface processes, impact cratering, volcanism, tectonics, and erosion, and a little bit of how we can learn the history of a world from studying its surface features. Then in later files, we'll look at examples of various planets and moons to get a sense of how these surface processes interact in different ways on different worlds. We'll finish up with the Earth, the largest and most complex solid world in the solar system, and get a sense of some of the unique features of the Earth's geology. There are four major processes that shape the surfaces of solid worlds. These four processes are impact cratering, volcanism, tectonics, and erosion. We're going to look at each of these in detail, but we should start by understanding that both volcanism and tectonics are primarily controlled by the internal heat of the planet. If the interior is hot enough that convection is possible inside the planet, then there will be plenty of energy to power volcanism and tectonics. Remember that this means that the interior has to be close to, but not necessarily at, the melting point. Composition will be important here, since it takes a lot less energy to melt ice than it does to melt rock. Also, erosion can be related to internal heating. Erosion usually depends on having an atmosphere, and volcanism is an important way for a planet to produce an atmosphere. So what's left to shape a world with little internal heat? Impact cratering. Impact cratering is the most important surface process in the solar system. An impact crater is a hole or depression in the ground. Craters are almost always round, and they often have raised walls around the outside and sometimes other features inside them. Impact craters are caused by asteroids and comets hitting the surfaces of worlds. This is a good point to mention, that the crater is the hole we see in the surface. The impactor is the thing that hits the surface. Planets are not hit by craters. Back in 1994, we actually watched pieces of a comet hitting a planet. Unfortunately, the planet was Jupiter, so it didn't produce any craters, since there isn't a solid surface for the crater to exist on. However, it did leave black debris in Jupiter's atmosphere for a while after the impacts. This event did illustrate the importance of the energy of the impactor. So we'll look at that next. One of the first big questions surrounding impact craters is why are almost all of them round? After all, objects hitting the surfaces of worlds should be hitting from any angle. So why don't they produce more oval-shaped craters stretched out in the direction the impactor was moving? To answer this, we have to consider what happens to the kinetic energy of an impactor when it hits the surface of a planet. When something like an asteroid hits a planet, it goes from moving at very high speed to being completely stopped. All of the kinetic energy it had while it was moving has to be converted to other forms, mostly heat and shock waves traveling through the impactor and the surface it hits. To figure out how much energy this is, we have to use the kinetic energy formula, K equals a half mv squared, where m is the mass of the impactor and v its speed just before it hits the surface. Remember that the mass has to be in kilograms and the speed in meters per second to get an answer in joules. There's a wide range of speeds that an impactor can have, but the minimum speed will be the escape speed from the surface of the planet. This is because the energy something gets from falling down from outer space is the same as the energy needed to blast off to get to outer space. This is only true if we can ignore the effects of the atmosphere. 
but it turns out that's okay for large impactors. Even a thick atmosphere like Venus's doesn't have much effect on the speed of a several kilometer asteroid, and thinner atmospheres like the Earth's do even less to slow down impactors. The escape speed from the surface of the Earth is 11.2 kilometers per second. The Moon is a lot smaller, so its escape speed is only 2.4 kilometers per second. Remember, these are the minimum speeds of the impactors. They could be moving faster, depending on how fast they were going as they approached the planet. Okay, go ahead and try calculating the kinetic energy of a 20-kilometer impactor hitting the surface of the moon. We'll assume it's going a little faster than the escape speed, 3 kilometers per second. Also, compare this to the energy released by exploding a kiloton of TNT. How many kilotons explosion is this? On the last calculation, you should have found that the impactor released as much energy as a 10 billion kiloton explosion. That's more energy than the entire nuclear arsenal of the Earth, and it was released in a single impact. So now it's easier to understand why an impact crater should be round. When an impactor hits the ground, it blows up. So what we're seeing is really an explosion crater. The explosion is large enough that the crater is typically 10 or more times the size of the original impactor. So a 20-kilometer asteroid will make a crater that's over 200 kilometers across. The large crater that fills most of this image is an example of such an impact, and there are craters on the moon that are much larger than this. Here's a simulation showing the steps in the formation of an impact crater. It starts with the impactor hitting the ground. Then the shock waves spread out and excavate a large region around the impactor, throwing material up and out of the crater, as well as compressing the ground around it. In the case shown here, there's also a central peak created. Both the peak and the crater walls then slump downwards, leaving a lower peak and perhaps terraced or step-like walls. Impact craters come in a huge range of sizes. The smallest craters found are only 10 to the minus 6 meters across, smaller than the thickness of a human hair. You can see such a crater on this microscopic image of a drop of solidified lunar lava. The largest craters are known as impact basins. They can be over a thousand kilometers across, like Valhalla Basin here on the surface of Jupiter's moon Callisto. Many impact basins have multiple rings of ridges instead of just a single outer wall. We have access to actual pieces of rock from the Earth and Moon. So on the Earth and Moon, we can use radioactive dating of rocks melted in impact to get an estimate of the ages of impact craters. Since there are a large number of preserved impact craters on the Moon, this allows us to put together an estimate of the cratering history in our part of the solar system. The chart on the right shows the result. The vast bulk of impact craters on the Moon formed more than 3.5 billion years ago, when the cratering rate was much higher than it is today. Since about 3 billion years ago, cratering has continued, but much less frequently than in this early period. On most worlds, we can't do direct measurements of crater ages the way we can for the Earth and the Moon. However, we can still use craters as a way of estimating the age of a planetary surface. All planets get hit regularly. As we mentioned earlier, having an atmosphere like the Earth or Venus does prevent the very smallest impactors from hitting the surface, but most of the objects that produce large, obvious impact craters penetrate these atmospheres without any difficulty. The most important thing, then, that decides how many large impact craters we see on a surface is the amount of other geologic activity it has. If a world has a lot of erosion, volcanism, and tectonics, then these will erase the craters on the surface. So when we see few impact craters on the surface of a world, 
we describe it as a young planetary surface. In this picture of the surface of Mercury, we see there are relatively few craters in the top half of the image because the lava flows have covered over all of the older impacts, leaving just the more recent ones visible. On the other hand, if a surface has very little volcanism, erosion, or tectonics, then we'll see lots of impact craters, and we describe it as an older surface. In the bottom half of the picture, you can see there are many more craters. In fact, there are almost as many craters as on some of the older parts of the moon's surface. This suggests that the older region may date back to the period almost 4 billion years ago when the cratering rate was still very high. Note that when we talk about the age of a planetary surface, we're really talking about how recently the surface has been refreshed, not the age of the world as a whole. There's no reason to expect that any of the worlds in our solar system to be any younger than 4 billion years old. It's just that many are good at hiding their age with some cover-up, and others use a kind of peel. What we just saw regarding impact craters is really just one example of an important geological concept called superposition. The idea behind superposition is that each time a new geologic feature forms, it tends to cover up or erase the ones that were previously there. So a volcanic flow will bury an impact crater, or the formation of a crater will destroy a river channel. Because of this, we can often put together the history of a surface simply by looking at which features appear to erase which other features. For example, have a look at this region on the surface of Mercury. Notice the long cliff or scarp that cuts through the picture from the top to near the bottom. This scarp cuts right through the impact craters at the top, including breaking through their walls. This tells us that the scarp formed after the impact crater. If the crater had formed later, the impact would have destroyed the cliff. Similarly, this picture of Jupiter's moon Ganymede shows a series of parallel ridges with some impact craters superimposed on them. Here you can see the obvious craters cut off the ridges, making it likely that the craters formed later. Here's a chance for you to try looking at the history of the surface of a world. Have a look at this picture of Saturn's moon Enceladus. We pointed out four sets of features. A set of small cracks running left-right across the image, especially in the top left portion. Another set of small cracks running up and down on the image. They're mostly visible in the upper half, though a few can be seen lower down. A large crack running horizontally across the middle of the image. And finally, a set of small craters, mainly visible in the lower half of the image. We'd like you to try explaining the order based on what you see in this image. In other words, don't start out by assuming that one type of thing always happens first. Instead, see which features cut off or erase which other features. That's what should define the order for you. 